Hello. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at Dialipsa, and I'm here to talk to you today about the history, history of virtualization and how we got here. I started writing this talk with the uh, entirely self-assigned goal of setting up some context for the rest of the talks that you'll see today at this conference, today and tomorrow. But in writing it, I found that my actual role was to share why I'm excited to be working in this space with all, at this time with all of you. I suspect that if I succeed in this goal, I'll actually achieve my first goal, because all the other speakers here are doing some really exciting work. So, what's past is prologue. History isn't just a list of things that happened, it's a story that explains the world around us. Some of the stuff I'm about to cover will be familiar to some of you, especially if you have uh, recent experience in computer science operating systems courses. But until recently, I wasn't you know, uh, fully up to date on it. Some examples of the things that we hope to understand better today. Uh, AWS runs you virtual machines. Java has a virtual machine. LLVM is the low-level uh, low language virtual machine. Uh, you can run Windows and QMU using a virtual machine. How did this term get so overloaded? So let's go back to the 1960s. At the turn of the decade, computers were room-sized batch processing mainframes. To unpack that a bit, code was compiled from uh, punch cards in one high-level language, and by high-level I mean Fortran, COBOL, or uh, the recently introduced Lisp, down to machine code uh, recorded on yet another set of uh, punch cards. To run a program, you'd walk these punch cards over to a computer lab, enqueue them to run everyone, after everyone else's punch cards, and wait for the results to be returned to you later. And woe betide you if your program crashed or somebody, uh, somebody's uh, program crashed before you. As a heads up, the next slide will have some video, but no audio. Behind me is Dr. Fernando Corbato at uh, MIT, giving an interview about time sharing. I've included a QR code link to this YouTube video, which is actually pretty interesting in and of itself. He's describing MIT's compatible time sharing system running on a modified IBM 7090 machine. Hold that word modified in your head for just a second. We'll come back to that. Uh, in the video, Dr. Corbato describes the cost of running a computer system uh, at the time, 300 to $600 in 1960s terms. That's 5,500 euro an hour, uh, roughly. Idle time was a killer. Dr. Corbato worked under Robert M. Fano at MIT. Fano worked closely with JCR Licklider, uh, pictured here, who was a former colleague who previously worked at BBN with John McCarthy on time sharing. Licklider, nicknamed Lick, became the head of the Information Processing Techniques Office at ARPA in 1962. Through his ties uh, with MIT, he funded work on the CTSS through Project Mac, the, the project on mathematics and computation. Project Mac would partner with Bell Labs, IBM, and others to pursue the goal of developing a time-shared standard operating system called Boltix. In order to achieve his goal of establishing a network of time-shared computers, Licklider also funded similar time-sharing projects at uh, Stanford, uh, the Augmentation Research Center, if you're familiar with the mother of all demos and Dunkel Singlebart, UC Berkeley, Project Genie, uh, where Melvin Conway worked, uh, uh, if you're aware of Conway's Law or Fork, uh, and others. But what is time sharing? Time sharing and multiprogramming are related concepts and are, for us today, a little bit like a fish trying to recognize water. The former mostly means to give multiple users the illusion of exclusive access to the machine, and the latter is a means to accomplish this, to multiplex programs on a single processor, to, uh, to make maximal use of the hardware. This is the thrumming engine, the core of every modern operating system, and it turns out most virtual machine, machine hypervisors is too. So how do we accomplish this? So one, with proper hardware support, we can in schedule an interrupt timer. Interrupts pause the flow of execution and return control to a master control program, supervisor, nucleus, or operating system. These are all terms that were kind of like extant at the time to describe an operating system. So if you're wondering like why the big bad in Tron is called master control program, it's from this. Uh, when it halts, it also uh, includes information about the state of the program. Two, the operating system operates the machine in a privileged mode. This is usually represented by protection rings. Unprivileged operations should not be possible to run in user mode. This includes things like setting interrupts and, well, virtual memory. So we're starting to talk about virtual stuff already. Uh, the breakthrough with virtual memory was that uh, while a program might ask to ask, 
access offset 13 in memory. That didn't necessarily need to map to, th to the 13th offset in physical memory. You could create an illusion of an address space using hardware in a couple of different ways. Uh, pictured here is the Atlas computer from the University of Manchester in the UK from 1959. This is the first bit, uh, computer built with virtual memory, uh, what was termed a one-level store at the time. This is a bit of an eye chart. I'm not going to ask you to like, read this in detail. But uh, the Atlas used paged memory, where it's close contemporary the 1961 Burroughs B5000 used segmentation. Both of these approaches have one important thing in common, using some out-of-band information uh, to complete a mapping between an incoming process address and a physical memory address. So on the top, we have, like, this is how segmentation works, and this is roughly how um, paging works on a 32-bit computer, 32-bit, like, Intel computer. So uh, virtual memory identified a contract between program and hardware that had been implicit and made it explicit, then used that as a lever to swap out the implementation. I say swap with kind of a pun intended here. Uh, this is actually the origin of being able to overcommit memory uh, by storing swap files. And indeed, early virtually me virtual memory uh, solutions didn't perform as well as uh, anticipated. Uh, they discovered something called thrash in the process. And this is actually part of why uh, CTSS had that modified uh, IBM machine. They had to modify it themselves. The universities had to make their own hardware for doing this virtual memory uh, implementation and uh, interrupt control. Uh, the only model in the market at the time, the only uh, model of computing was batch processing, and there was no proof at all that time sharing would be an uh, actual market. So the story of the 1960s is uh, the story of developing these operating systems. Uh, by the end of the 1960s, the 1968, there was a, uh, a NATO conference, uh, uh, 1968 Software Engineering Summit, uh, which gathered 50 sci computer scientists from across the field to discuss the state of the art and its shortcomings. This is uh, what popularized the term that Margaret Atwood coined, stop software engineering, and kind of identified it as a set of unmet needs in the industry. Chief among the shortcomings was the torturous development of these time-shared operating systems. It cost IBM at the time $5 billion over four years to ship the System 360 to Project Mac. And it still didn't meet the uh, specifications. The 360 ended up being massively successful in its own right. It was the first system capable of being upgraded without having to recode all the programs on the machine, but was still a batch processor. So there was a lot of tension between uh, the hardware engineers and software engineers at this point. Uh, Douglas McElroy of Bell Labs summed this up the situation well in his uh, talk at the, at the summit, mass-produced software con components. I'm going to read his quote in full here. We undoubtedly pr produce software by backwards techniques. We undoubtedly get the short end of the stick in confrontations with the hardware people because they are the industrialists and we are the crofters. I would like to see standard catalogs of routines classified by precision, robustness, time-space performance, size limits, and binding time of parameters. I would like to apply routines in the catalog to any one of a large class of often quite different machines without too much pain. This sounds a lot like what the registry working group is building. Speaking of WASM and virtual memory, this stuff is still relevant today. While x86-64 largely ditched segmentation in favor of paging for virtual memory, segment registers are still used to improve performance when accessing thread local offsets. Indeed, there's a te technique called Segway that can be used to improve code size and performance of WASM memory. At the same time, many wa wa modern WASM runtimes use something called guard pages to protect access to locations outside of bound memory by allocating protection re protected regions unmapped to physical memory, just eight gigabytes of address space, and trapping on access to that. This, of course, you know, uses up the address space, so there are problems with that. There's, it limits the number of uh, WASM memories you can have in a single process address space. But there is a technique called color guard that uses something called memory protection keys to uh, allow you to pack more uh, WASM memories into a single process. Uh, for more on this, see Bridging the Architecture Divide by Tal Garfinkel from last year's WASMCon. Back to the past. While IBM failed to win Project Mac's business, it was, as I mentioned, an overall success. But at the time it was seen as a crushing blow, IBM had even established a research lab in Cambridge near MIT to facilitate ties with the project. Forgive the imperial units here, but like, it's a 17-minute walk. They, they, that's expensive real estate. Uh, 
Although the, so there was a team working there, this Cambridge team, and although their, their project had been canceled, the uh, uh, time-sharing operating system for the 60, System 360, the TSS 360, uh, had been canceled, they developed a, a modder system of their own that ran virtual System 360 machines, what they called pseudo-machines or early virtual machines. So we're starting to see a split between virtual machine modders and modders, or hypervisors and supervisors, or hypervisors and operating systems at this point. There's kind of a sense that our industry got out over our skis in the 1960s, and the bill came due. In 1969, uh, the Mansfield Amendments were introduced in US Congress. These proposed to restrict defense funding of ARPA projects to those with uh, strict direct military applications. This had a chilling effect on research in academia. Talent from the Project Mac generation flooded into the commercial market. At the same time, we're just on the cusp of some really incredible leaps forward. The Intel 4004 IC CPU is released in 1971 to power digital terminals, terminals for time-shared computers. That picture behind me is uh, actually from 1980, so it's a little anachronistic, but the concept is the same. The way they designed these, these processors was by using a sheet of emulsion called RubyLith. So they would cut the uh, circuit pattern into it and then photo reduce it repeatedly and then transfer that to a glass plate. So informed by the research done on CPCMS and the System 360, Gerald J. Popek and Robert P. Goldberg uh, proposed formal requirements for virtualiz virtualizable architecture in 1974. Uh, in particular, they established that privilege and instructions run in user mode uh, must trap and return control to the hypervisor. This was a very important property that hardware manufacturers at the time promptly ignored. So among the ashes of Project Mac, Bell Labs pulled out the Multix project in 1969 and refocused on batch pro processing. This left Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie with some time on their hands. They found an old PDP-7 and started porting a space travel game from a Multix GCOS machine that they had been working on. They started with a file system uh, and uh, just a simple operating system with two users, so it was time-shared but not like fully multi-programmed yet. And this, the seed of this became Unix. In 1977, spurred by the successes of other teams of porting Unix to run on System 370 virtual machines, descendants of those CPCMS uh, virtual machines, the Bell Labs team undertook to port Unix for the PDP-11 to the Interdata 832. Unix had been largely rewritten in C in 1974, but C was developed without the goal of portability in mind at first. It required a number of modifications to portably represent data types. Type defs, unsigned integers, and unions were added to the language. In the process of porting Unix to the interdata, both Unix and C escaped the confines of Bell Labs. Bell Labs, it's important to note, was, was at this point bound by a 1956 consent decree, an antitrust rule, that forced Bell to make all of its patents available royalty-free and prevented AT&T from commercializing Unix. We'll come back to that. Uh, speaking of back, uh, back to the 1960s briefly to talk about P-codes. Uh, P-codes, portable codes, have their origin in Pascal and its predecessor Euler by Nicholas Vert. P-Codes described a virtual processor, an execution architecture with no direct physical analog, so sort of an ideal computer. Uh, in practice, they were used as an intermediate language for compilers, splitting the front-end parser from the back-end code generator. This aided portability. We still use this technique today. New back-ends can be added easily to support new architectures. Interpreters for P-Code could also be written and recompiled for each target machine, predicting the language virtual, virtual machine. Speaking of which, Smalltalk. Smalltalk originated in the aftermath of the Mansfield Amendments. Much of the Project Mac and Genie teams joined Xerox Park along with Alan Kay. Uh, he had a vision of personal computing as a basic skill attainable by children. He developed this vision into a programming language called Smalltalk, wh whose core metaphor was to represent the machine as an infinite nesting of computers, all interacting with one another via messages, which would lead to the actor model later. Smalltalk was defined in terms of a bytecode execution architecture inspired by Euler with a ton of optimization work done in Smalltalk 80. Dan Ingalls, one of the implementers of Smalltalk, uses the term virtual machine to describe the set of primitive operations sufficient to support a computer system. In other words, he doesn't think there should be an operating system. It should just be a virtual machine. So now we're in the thick of it. Integrated circuits uh, transformed the computer market. Personal computer kits became available. A 1982 consent decree broke up AT&T, which had the perverse effect of actually allowing the new owners of Bell Labs to sell Unix System 5 uh, directly. This actually wiped out Microsoft's Xenix product, which caused them to cozy up to IBM for the, uh, their OS2 and PCAT projects. 
Before long, uh, the PC clone market had taken off with Windows as the dominant operating system atop Intel's x86 chips, distant, uh, descendants of the Intel 4004s we talked about. On the other side of the industry, uh, pursuing the 3M computer requirement, a uh, megapixel display, a megabyte of memory, and a million operations a second, proposed by Raj Reddy of CMU, uh, workstations emerged as a distinct market, usually running some flavor of Unix. Xerox uh, and newcomers Apple, SGI, and Sun are, were competing in this space. Sun was starting to win the workstation market with its affordable workstations built from commodity hardware, like Motorola 68Ks. This actually had knock-on effects for Xerox. Uh, Smalltalk doesn't run particularly well on these machines. Famously, Joe Armstrong was designing telephony for Ericsson on a Sun workstation running Smalltalk. Uh, he mentions in the history of Erlang, uh, the garbage collection cycles for Smalltalk were long enough that he could take a coffee break. And while he was waiting for a new Tektronix Smalltalk machine to be delivered, his coworker introduced him to Prolog, planting the seeds for Erlang. No discussion of the 90s would be complete without talking about Java. So Java began life as part of Project Green in 1990, a language platform designed around a set-top box that would wirelessly program the proliferating microcomputers in home VCRs, hotel doorknobs, etc. The platform language, called Oak at the time, was designed to look like C while possessing an object-oriented design evocative of a small talk, implemented as a bytecode language virtual machine, so it could run on all those devices very easily. However, by 1994, the future of web TV began to look a lot more like stripped-down PCs than microcontrollers, and SGI had to outbid the Java team for a, a set-top box bid for Time Warner's business, so Java had to start to fend for itself with its Sun, and it had steep competition with, within Sun. There was already teams working on C++, Tickle, Clarity, IDL, which was one of the first languages to call itself an interface definition language, and Self, a descendant of Smalltalk. So they look for a killer app. Uh, luckily, it's 1994, the web is a big thing. Uh, the, the team goes to write something called Netrunner and adapts Java's radio transmitted code distribution to the web. Before long, they have a waving Duke mas mascot on their screen and the first Java applet was born. Sun primarily made its money at this point from server hardware and software, so it was seen as a good deal if they could get developers to write Java on the server as well as on the client. So they uh, soon struck a deal with Netscape to make Java available in Netscape browsers. Uh, there was such a rush to claim territory in the language VM space, even AT&T got in on the action, putting its Plan 9 operating system on the back burner in favor in, of something called Inferno and its virtual machine, DIS. So uh, uh, Java killed Plan 9. Uh, this is from InfoWorld. I mean, there's no such thing as direct causes, single direct causes, but uh, they did get put on the back burner uh, to work on a competitor, Java. So there's a lot we could talk about here, about uh, so the team working on optimizing JIT runtimes for small talk in self and strong talk went on to write the Java hotspot VM, for example. But the key question is really, Java was a stack-based uh, bytecode virtual machine. Why aren't we at a Java conference? Are we at a Java conference? <laughs> to oversimplify drastically, the software industry of the 90s was a much different retail-driven beast. So Microsoft killed Netscape outright by turning their entire product into a bundled feature of their operating system. And while Microsoft bundled their own JVM, they added proprietary Windows-only extensions to the platform while not fully implementing others. So Sen was treading a very careful line here, but couldn't let this stand. They had to bring suit against Microsoft in 1997, settling the case in 2001, uh, Windows XP would no longer ship with a JVN, JVM, and Java applets in the browser were kind of removed. And then, of course, the dot-com crash happened. Commodity server hardware flooded the market from failed startups, and com uh, com coupled with the rise of commodity Linux operating systems, the writing started to be on the wall for Sun. But let's talk about our servers. The dot-com boom saw AltaVista hosted on DEC alphas to LiveJournal hosted on almost certainly X Intel x86-based Dell servers in 2000. But the, the common wisdom, people tried to scale up at this point, but there's only so far you can scale up. It's expensive to develop faster hardware. Um, it's much easier to start reaching for commodity hardware and scale out. Uh, and commodity hardware meant, at this point, the x86. So remember when I said that hardware man manufacturers at the time ignored those virtualization requirements, the Popek and Goldberg requirements? Well, 
x86 architecture didn't meet any of the requirements. Um, to be fair, the x86 line was born from personal computing, supporting like virtualized DOS programs in Windows and OS 2, not meant to virtualize entire like time-sharing operating systems. But this meant concretely in user mode, some segmentation changes would, would be visible, some privileged in instructions would silently no op instead of trapping, and this was an issue. Uh, this is actually a, a quote, lightly paraphrased, from the patent that uh, founded VMware. Uh, they were using direct binary translation on hypervised operating systems. So whenever the operating system would switch into a protect, protected mode, the hypervisor would begin translating instructions, injecting traps manually at any privileged call site. So whenever it saw something that should actually trap, it would just add an instruction to trap. Unfortunately, this uh, enabled virtualization, but it was really hard to quantify uh, per like performance. Um, it, it affected performance, and it was hard to assign the uh, like slow down to any given you know, virtual machine. But Zen changed all that. Um, this is a uh, paper called Zen and the Art of Virtualization. Um, they used a technique called para-virtualization. Uh, in para-virtualization, the virtualized operating system uh, subsystem is aware of the virtual nature of its resources and makes concessions to that end. So in particular, Zen modified Linux and Windows operating systems to run at a lower protection ring while making hypervisor calls available to them to perform their most privileged tasks. Importantly, Zen actually enabled Chris Pinkham's team at Amazon to build EC2 starting in 2004, shortly after the famous services edict by uh, Bezos in 2002 or 2003. And the demand for uh, virtualization by cloud computing companies directed hardware companies to start building in support for virtualization at the hardware level, Intel's VTX and AMD's AMD V. And modern operating systems are beginning to ship with hypervisors, sometimes running atop them. So Microsoft's Hyper-V, Mac OS's hypervisor.framework, Linux's KVM. The current state of the art, as far as I know, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is using something uh, called BV PVHVM, which is hardware virtualization with uh, para-virtualization for drivers. So something, uh, para-virtualizing devices using something called Virdio. This lets you run extremely lightweight operating systems, which brings us to Containers. Uh, there's more one way to solve the uh, problem of x86 virtualization, and one way to solve it is just not solve it. Uh, just virtualize something else. Virtualize the system interface. Containers draw their inspiration from BSD jails, truths, and Solaris zones. Uh, other uh, early examples of this were Virtuoso and uh, Linux vServer, uh, which attempted to create virtual servers using these techniques. They're really a combination of three kernel-level features, seccomp, secure computing, cgroups, and namespaces. Namespaces were added to the Linux kernel first, starting with a mount namespace inspired by Plan 9, uh, and then growing to include process ID trees, users, file system mounts, uh, et cetera. Cgroups, or control groups, were proposed later by Google, which allow the operator of the machine to assign quotas of disk and network usage, as well as CPU and memory usage, kind of completing the uh, ability to use this as a virtual machine. Unfortunately, while these effectively partition research use, resource use for trusted programs, coordinating use of the machine between untrusted partners requires extra care because these mechanisms are fine-grained and capable of being layered. So hypervised oper operating systems are still considered safer targets for multi-tenancy. That said, we're seeing these converge too. Containers and virtual machines have converged uh, with uh, Kata and Firecracker. Uh, and these, these will run containers in uh, minimal virtual machines. And the last uh, attempt to circumvent problems with x86 that I'll mention is uh, virtual ISs. In the mid to late 90s, alongside the difficulties of virtualizing x86, the industry was concerned that it wouldn't scale as an architecture, so compared to RISC or very large instruction word processors. There were a number of attempts to build hardware and software to bridge this gap, uh, uh, the Transmatic Rousseau, uh, DAISY, and finally LLVA. 2003's LLVA described a virtual architecture complementary to LLVM, actually from the same author, Chris Latner, uh, which would be used to co-design hardware and ISA, virtual ISA. I note it here mostly because it's as close as I can come to finding an origin for the term virtual ISA, which pops up in the WASM spec. So it also bookends the story of P codes very nicely. This is actually the part I'm going to spend the least amount of time on, despite how much I love JavaScript. Um, JavaScript had actually emerged the unlikely victor of the war for the web platform, despite mostly being a hedge against Microsoft putting Visual Basic in the browser. The Self and StrongTalk teams that pioneered just-in-time compilation techniques for Smalltalk actually applied those lessons to Java's hotspot, and then from Java to JavaScript via the V8 engine. JavaScript pioneered zero-trust software distribution, but was an extremely limited and 
quirky platform for some time. It was difficult or impossible to run software written for a traditional architecture atop JS. And alternatives at the time were disqualified by their ownership incentives. Usually these solutions that were owned by a single company, Flash through Adobe, Silverlight through Microsoft, Knackle and Pinnacle through Google. And they were often large enough targets that convincing multiple browser vendors to adopt and support them was a non-starter. But that changed in 2013 with Asm.js, um, introduced by Alon Zakai's uh, Inscription project. Asm.js identified a subset of JavaScript that could be proven to match an architecture compatible with traditional C or abstract machines. So browser machines could detect a use Asm directive, then validate the bytecode like JS that followed. And scripting allowed these C abstract uh, machine programs to target the browser using their existing compiler by adding a new backend code generator to LLVM. IR, P codes. In much the way, same way C had extracted a portable abstract machine by porting to the Interdata 832, ASM.js chiseled out a portable abstract machine from a concrete implementation of multiple virtual machines. As you know, uh, some folks in this very room got together to develop ASM.js further into a bytecode-based virtual ISA, and you're here. So why am I excited? So just last month, uh, the, White, the US White House issued a statement on the importance of memory safety. Software is everywhere, and our tools have betrayed us for years. But I think it's a mistake to think that we should or even could throw, away them, throw them away uh, just because they've hurt us. WebAssembly lets us keep what works about our tools while making them all safer. In much the same way that Docker made it possible to safely coordinate programs running on a single server by virtualizing their resources, WebAssembly makes it possible to safely share the address space of a single process. And where that's not enough protection, we're already seeing, seeing that hypervisors and operating systems are beginning to converge, allowing for things like Microsoft's Hyperlight, which is capable of capable, uh, calling a hypervised WebAssembly virtual machine in hundreds of microseconds. It's not like nanoseconds like function calls, but that's still incredibly fast. But this is only part of why I'm excited. So every advance in virtualization has ushered in changes to the industry. What can be built? Timesharing created virtual computing. Virtualization gave Bell Labs confidence to port the Unix to the Interdata 832. Zen-style pair virtualization made the cloud possible. Container and orchestration systems extend our reach into distributed systems. Well, as you can see, like, I'm kind of casting Wasm as the main character here, but that, it seems like a lot of roads lead to this. Uh, you can see time sharing and instruction set architectures split up there, and then uh, supervisors and hypervisors, and it all, all kind, of, kind of comes together there. So I think Ward Cunningham put it best. WebAssembly connects past and future. So yeah, thank you very much.